Welcome back, Miner, to Deep Rock Galactic. We here at R&D have covered every weapon and overclock at your disposal, but Hoxie's is filled with surprises that will leave those weapons along with your bones melting in lava. So grab your pickaxe, Miners, because we are going to be learning about some rock and stone. Boarding our drop pod and drilling just past the surface, we find our first set of cave systems. The sandblasted corridors have formed within a layer of sandstone, eroded into existence due to subterranean winds. Along with the serrated dust slowly peeling your skin off, these high-pressure jets have unearthed fossils of ancient vegetation and wildlife that once roamed the Hoxie surface. Though tougher rocks may emerge, the sandstone walls will easily crumble when struck with a pickaxe, despite the high levels of quartz grains scratching the blade. Mining just beneath the sub subterranean desert, we find a subterranean forest. The Azure Weald is comprised of the metamorphic rock Serpentinite. A bit of a strange sight given its proximity to the surface and a lack of nearby volcanic activity, but Hoxie's 4 is as small and volatile as a spoiled child, so who knows what cataclysmic tectonic event could have caused this. Stranger still, Lapis Lazuli shares similar formation conditions, but with different materials. At least the large quantity of Lapis has increased its psychic warding to physical warding. Also of note is the high amount of vegetation growing off of these solid metamorphic walls, though this one can be explained as exposure to the layer below. The Fungus Bogs is a porous wad of mud that lies over half a kilometer below the surface and is considered the armpit of Hoxie's with its ooey gooey grossness. Greenery runs rampant in this zone, so the mud it's made up of must be a loam mixture. This substrate would provide all the nutrients required to sustain such a vast fungal colony by way of the decaying plant matter found in its composition. However, the components of this loam are uncharacteristically spread into clumps of clay, silt, and sand instead of being a homogeneous mixture. I'm sure you're all wondering what those words mean. But more importantly, where the plant matter of the mix could have come from this deep below, so let's head on over to the Hollow Bow. Truly a marvel of Hoxie's once thriving ecosystem, this biome is dominated by massive ancient tree hollows and their parasitic counterparts. Looking past the innuendo amount of wood, we can witness the dry origins of the muddy loam from above. There is a good chance that the hollow bow was once twice its size, and excessive flooding in the upper caves led to the cultivation of hostile fungi that eroded the remaining trees. With both vines and mushrooms as an active threat, the hollow bow may not be around for much longer. Uh, but we can't dwell on that. We have more rocks and stones to look at. Beneath us is the dense biozone, a layer of hematite and blue schist that formed from an iron-rich seabed subducting into Hoxie's boiling inner layers. Uh, it got squished by a big rock into some hot stuff. But these ancient ocean floors did see water after their retirement. The caves themselves were likely formed from flowing water and the presence of a submerged environment allowed coral structures to flourish once again. The underground lakes eventually drained, but the paths that first brought the water in are still active and frequently bless the rocky landscape with subterranean rain. Moving down to the next layer, we actually stumble into a very large and very durable obstacle. The crystalline caverns are a massive geode formation, with quartz walls, amethyst spires, and blue quartz hazards. Nat blue quartz, also known as dumortierite quartz, gains its color from high amounts of metals like manganese and zinc in its composition. Couple that with the already conductive nature of quartz crystals and you have a conduit for electrical discharge. Due to the immense size of this geode, it actually pierces through the entirety of the next zone, so let's execute excavate the walls and enter the salt pits. These crimson caverns further support the narrative of Hoxie's once having a vast ocean. The environment is comprised of a red variation of the sedimentary rock Chert. This substance forms from the skeleton-riddled sands lining the bottom of large bodies of water. Over the years, moisture not only formed the caves themselves, but also the large salt structures and stalactites throughout the biome. Some of these salt structures have a red or pink hue, likely caused by oxidized iron leaking out of the red Chert walls, but that coloration doesn't stop it from tasting delicious when sprinkled on your boiled bug bits. At the 2 kilometer mark, we've reached the radioactive exclusion zone. Traversing through this wasteland is ill-advised, so most researchers just assume the white walls are made of marble and move on. But I personally believe this speckled environment is made of granite. Not only is granite significantly harder than marble, putting it at the same durability class as the quartz we found earlier, but according to this very scientific website, uranium is found more commonly in granite. And guess what we have littering the walls? Giant radioactive crystals! While these are commonly accused of being uranium, these are likely torbernite 
chalcolite crystals. Also known as chalcolite, torbernite is a radioactive byproduct that owes its green coloration and skin dissolving warmth to the uranium within its chemical composition. Alright, my bones are starting to get itchy, so let's leave this radiant hazard and head down to the ninth layer. We have now reached the most anomalous aspect of Hoxie's 4. Five kilometers down and one kilometer thick is a planet-wide layer of permafrost. The glacial strata should be melting from all the pressure of the continental plates above and the heat from the core below, but it maintains its frozen beauty despite this. Moreover, the environment of the strata is completely blue, meaning the permafrost is pure and lacks debris during its formation. Wait, hold on. There's a don't ask order here, so we best get moving on to the last location. The Magma Core is a series of basalt caves that have been flash frozen into existence, likely from chunks of the strata breaking off and plunging into the magma below. This quick cooling explains the columnar jointing of the cave walls and many stalactites frozen in their liquid appearance. But that doesn't mean this place is stable. Frequent earthquakes rip this rock asunder and the magma from outside is quickly leaking in along with melting thin layers of basalt. Now that we have all the information on the Hoxie's geology, we can examine what it means for the planet itself. There was once a vast ocean drenching most of the planet, but that isn't the only instance of large bodies of water as seen by the planet-wide glacial strata. Wait a second. If the glacial strata is one kilometer thick, halfway between the surface and the magma core, and encompasses the planet, then wouldn't we see instances of its brilliant blue nature at this cross-section? Even teleporting to the fracture using a wormhole special not only reveals no ice, but also no magma nor basalt. This suggests that the lava we see on the scanner isn't the surface of the magma core, but a layer of lava that exists above the glacial strata. Odds are the lava flows beneath the radioactive exclusion zone, freezing against the strata and providing an answer to the 2 km gap between the layers. If this molten rock starts at 3 km deep, then that makes the radius of Hoxie's about 13.4 km. Planet no longer applies to this celestial body. Let's do a size comparison. This is Earth from the Sol system, and its moon next to it. And here's Hoxie's 4. What, having a hard time seeing it? At a diameter of 26.8 kilometers, it's only 2 kilometers wider than the moon of Saturn Telesto. It's the same size as Malta! At this size, Hoxie's could barely be considered a satellite. I have no idea how it maintains its spherical shape, but the floating fragment has been airborne for the last six years because gravity isn't strong enough to pull the pieces back together. The nonsensical placement of rock structures on top of ice sheets, the turbulent subterranean weather, the constant rattling of the outer core, all signs of the planet's complex structure tearing itself apart. And to add insult to injury, the lithophage meteorites crashing through Hoxie's are pushing it out of orbit, and any dwarves left behind are going to be boiled alive as this dirtwad hurtles into Kreis and is erased from the universe with an unceremonious puff of smoke! <sighs> so to finish this video off, Hoxie's 4 is not the planet we thought it was. It's merely a pile of rock and stone. Special thanks to my Patreons for supporting this psychotic breakdown. I don't know why I thought it was a good idea to make an April Fool's video into a geology class. At least I had fun ironically staring at pictures of rocks for the last week straight and finally being able to prove that Hoxie's 4 is not a planet. If my boy Pluto can't be one, then neither can you. Anyway, I have some other moon-adjacent structures that I need to liberate, so I'll see you when you escape Hoxie's 4's fate. For the love of God, <laughs> I've been trying for the last, like, seven hours to find the Lapis Lazuli, and I keep finding this 
damned hole. I, I'm losing my mind. I'm going insane. This is four in a row. I don't know what the odds of this spawning four times in a row is, but it's definitely lower than finding the Lapras. Uh...